Hey everyone, today I'm speaking with David Papineau, one of the world's most distinguished philosophers and a real expert in the philosophy of mind. If you enjoy this show, please consider subscribing to be notified of future episodes. And I'm sorry for the audio in this episode. It's slightly worse than usual because of a problem during recording. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for doing this. Very glad to be here. Thanks How for having me. How are you doing today? Fine. Everything good so far. Good, good. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is if we could just travel back in time a little bit to when you were younger. I think you were born in Como in Italy. That's right. Can you tell me a bit about your life when you were brought up there? I can't remember it at all. Uh, we left when I was about three or four, if not earlier, I think three. Uh, my parents were just, my father was working there after, after the war in, in Milan. Uh, and uh, it was the start of a rather peripatetic childhood. We traveled around uh, a great deal. What were you like as a child? What were you interested in? Did you have any favorite subjects at school or anything interesting? I, I had a funny education. So my parents were both born in London, but and then they met in Cairo in the, in the war, and and then they went into the invasion of Italy uh, uh, at the end of the war, and I think got to like it, and then they stayed there, and then they came back to London, and then they went to the Caribbean, and then we came back to England. And we, my father worked in Lancashire for a while, and then we went to South Africa. So I had a very mixed education. I, my high school education was was all in South Africa. For some reason, we had a very limited curriculum. So we did six subjects, and one of them was Latin, and then history and English and maths and science and Afrikaans. No room for any other languages. Uh, one one slot for science, and I kind of liked all the subjects. I mean, Afrikaans not so much, uh, and didn't mind it. But uh, uh, I was in a class with quite a few native Afrikaans speakers, so uh, I wasn't able to be any good at it. Uh, whereas I was fine at all the other subjects. And uh, but maths must have been the favourite one because that's what I went on to do at university. I mean, I. I, I I, you know, I liked English and uh, did find it in history, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking of studying them at university. I, I pretty much went straight to maths. I studied maths at University of Natal, what's, oh, what's now the University of KwaZulu, Natal in Durban. And I did that for four years uh, at university. I went to university very young. I was only just 16 when I went to university. And uh, so, I would have been only just 20 when I finished those those four years. But I did, I did four years of, it wasn't all pure maths, it was quite a lot of physics and economics and mathematical statistics I did quite a lot of. Before you decided to study maths, had you stumbled across any philosophy at all? No, I didn't really, wasn't really on my horizon then as a, as a 15 year old. I mean, uh, I got interested while I was at university in those, in those four years towards the, towards the end. Uh, but at school, I wasn't really an intellectual, I don't think. Uh, I read a lot. I mean, I, I just read a lot, but I read a lot of, a lot of fiction and I read a few non-fiction books, popular science books and, and so on. Uh, but I didn't, did I think of myself as an intellectual? Not specially, I don't think. Mm -hmm. no. So when did your interest in philosophy begin? You, after you did your degree in maths, I think you switched and did a, another degree in philosophy. Yeah, that's, when I, I, that's when I went to Cambridge and I did, a mm -hmm. second, I did a second first degree in philosophy, or rather moral sciences, as it was called, mm -hmm. as it was called then. And I suppose, in the course of those first four years of university studying maths, uh, I became interested.
interested in what what my friends other students were doing. First psychology, I became quite interested in in psychology and yes, I suppose I wasn't I mean no, that was kind of the becoming intellectual. I, I, I would grab my friends psychology textbooks and devour them and they thought I was completely weird but to me it was just like you know reading a page turning novel I, I really wanted to know so and and then I got interested in philosophy as well and I read Bertrand Russell I read A.J. Eyre The Problem of Knowledge uh, my father had done PPE at Oxford so I mean he had really he was more of an economist than a, than a philosopher by a long way, but he uh, had a few philosophy books and, uh, and that air book was one of them. And it was funny because my friends, it was a very political time in South Africa. This was in, in the 60s. And a lot of my friends were reading Marx and Sartre and, uh, and which were banned books. It was kind of dangerous. We passed them around and I read them, but uh, they didn't do anything for me intellectually. I mean, it was turgid, it was hard going. And then I came across AJ Air, and I thought this was kind of clean, fresh air. I loved it. I, I gobbled that up, gobbled that up too. Mm -hmm. So, yes. There was something else I was going to say, but I've lost my, lost my thread of thought, so you better ask another question. No problem. What um, do you think it was about air and related philosophers that kind of did something for you that Sartre and others didn't? Mm, I don't know. I remember what I was going to say. I was going to say that at the time, and for some years afterwards, I, I, I told myself, no, I was, I was pretty good at maths. I mean, I was, you know, I, 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 I passed all the exams, I got top marks. Uh, I could kind of learn the theorems and learn the problem techniques just fine. And so for a while, I told myself that. Yeah, you know, I was really pretty good at maths, but I found it boring, and so I, you know, I wanted—I didn't want to spend the rest of my life thinking about maths. I, and I wanted to to uh, branch out and uh, find out. I mean, I was very curious and find out how things worked. Uh, but in retrospect, I can see I wasn't any kind of mathematician at all. I mean, I never found myself trying to pursue some mathematical topic beyond what I'd been taught and think, you know, did this follow from that or could I could I show this further thing? And that such thoughts never went through my mind. So I, I wasn't any kind of mathematician. And uh, I guess what grabbed me about psychology and philosophy is is precisely that I my, I was curious. I, I wasn't really curious within mathematics, but I was curious in those subjects. I did want to figure out what came next, what followed from what, try and work it out good out for myself and, and I suppose the traction of air as opposed to continental like Marx uh, uh, is that it was at least had the appearance of of clarity that here we had we had this proposition did this one follow from it uh, uh, what would happen if you introduced this further premise and so on uh, I mean, as you know, when you get into philosophy more, a lot of writers with that kind of limpid clarity uh, uh, underneath the various assumptions that aren't on the surface, that uh, are dubious and messing things up, it's not always as clear as it seems. But still, I mean, you're trying to be clear, and that's, that's what attracted me. Mm. You said your father studied PP at Oxford. Yeah. Can I ask what your mother did or studied or what does? She studied geography at Oxford. Uh, so they both went to Oxford at rather different times. My father would have gone in the beginning of the 30s and my mother at the end, end of the 30s. Uh, and very different backgrounds. And my, my mother was from an Orthodox Jewish family, Hampstead, London. And my father was from a middle class family of doctors and engineers and policemen and school teachers in the east side of London. Uh, if you look back at the family tree, it's all, it's all Leighton and uh, Buckhurst Hill and Chigwell. Uh, my father went to Chigwell School, minor public school. 
that also has the distinction of being the, the school that Bernard Williams, a great philosopher, went to. Mm. I see you've, I've seen online that you've written a bit about the underrepresentation of women within philosophy. Was your mother interested in philosophy? Not really, not really. Uh, uh, neither of my parents were... I think they probably would have liked to be academics, but uh, it didn't work out that way. And so there wasn't a lot of kind of academic debate in my house. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't, you know, educated and informed, but, but uh, uh, discussions of the latest book in sociology or philosophy or geography didn't really come up. Sure. Yeah. And then you carried on at Cambridge and did a PhD in philosophy. That's right. What, what was your research on for that? Well, I was supposed to. The, 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 those were very different days. I mean, I, I did two years of philosophy as an undergraduate because Cambridge has a system you can be what's still called, I think, an affiliated student. You do a second, first degree in a new subject, but you're only required to do two years of the three years and then you get a degree. And at that time at Cambridge, uh, you either did practical philosophy in the German sense, uh, ethics, history, political philosophy, or you did, and I did, philosophy of science, philosophy of mass, mathematical logic, and philosophical logic. That was my, that was my second year. So that was all technical stuff. So I really only had one year of of regular philosophy in my education, and I went straight into a PhD. No, no, no MA, no MPhil, and I was supposed to be working on probability and statistical inference. And Cambridge was a great place for that at the time. We had Hugh Miller and Andy in hacking, and I was probably too too green still, like in mathematics. I really didn't have any ideas on that topic and I got excited by it was a time of it was the 60s and relativism and Kuhn and Feyerabend and, and Feyerabend was a terrible philosophy of science terribly exciting writer and Kuhn Kuhn structure type equations pretty exciting so so I got very interested in that but I wasn't one to defend or develop relativism in the way Feyerabend went, uh, kind of anti-rationalism. My inclinations were strongly, strongly rationalist. So, so I ended up writing a PhD, uh, kind of arguing how you can defend rationality in science from some of the assumptions of Kuhn and Feyerabend. I mean, I tried to show how you could be rational within their assumptions, so to speak. So it was a, it was a fun, a fun time. And, and Ian Hacking, my my supervisor, who uh, is a wonderful uh, example of a, of a uh, philosopher who's contributed to all kinds of different different areas, uh, he was very supportive. I mean, he allowed me to change. He allowed me to change subjects in the middle of the PhD. I mean, it was perfectly uh, okay thing to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, not an issue at all. And after your PhD, what were you up to for the first few years after that? Where did you carry on working, and what did you, what did you get up to? Again, in retrospect, it was a kind of strange, tough time, and there were scarcely any jobs. Uh, it's quite striking to me that my philosophical peers now, and for the last 20 or 30 years, have all been 10 or 20 years younger than me, because the time I got a job, 1973, and I got a job straight up, three years of the PhD into a job because I had no money, I needed a job. Uh, uh, I really did. And uh, as I remember, I, I applied for a few JRF's junior research fellowships at Oxford and Cambridge and didn't quite get any of those. And I was going to get a job as a research assistant to two kind of philosophers of social science and Middlesex Polytechnic. And they said, no, you really don't want this job. You're overqualified, and I said, no, well, I'd like this job because I really need a job. And uh, but I got a job in the sociology department at the University of Reading, 
which wasn't a natural career path for an aspirant philosopher, but in fact it was a terrific job. And I was there for four years and uh, 73 through 77. And the professor there was a Polish emigre, Stanislaw Andreski. Uh, and he was of the generation, he'd been a young officer in Poland during the war and uh, the Germans had taken over and the officers were all being shipped off somewhere and he kind of got a sense of which way the wind was blowing and took the stripes off his sleeves and kind of slipped into the ranks and uh, managed to escape being massacred at Katyn. And, uh, and he was a fine fellow. He was from the Polish logical and empiricist tradition. And he thought that sociology students should be taught some, some proper logic and Mill's methods of induction and basic methodology. I had a course called Methodology. I taught them quite a lot of Kuhn and Feyerab, but but it was it was good training. It was a very interesting department. He hired many other Eastern European emigres who uh, interesting, striking figures. A lot of them, uh, uh, woman Maria Hershevitz, who was a very early feminist uh, uh, in the in the fifties and sixties, scarcely a subject anybody was working on, and and many other interesting people. So I was there for four, four years and it was very good education. I learned a lot of sociology. I mean, I, I, I learned about Marx, Durkheim, Weber. And I wrote my first book out of the, the lectures I gave there for four, for four years. Uh, it's still a book I quite like called Four Science in the Social Sciences. You can see, see which way my, my uh, inclinations on relativism lie. I thought the social sciences should be scientific. And you've worked on a number of areas throughout your career. Can you explain kind of about some of your main focuses and what you focused on and maybe why you've chosen to, to work on them? I, I'm a very, I've got a roving eye as a philosopher. I, you know, I get interested in something and I work, on it, work it out to my satisfaction and then I'm likely to to move on to something else. And uh, I mean, other philosophers will just have one topic and work at it all their life. And uh, and I'm not saying that, that that's not a good way to be a philosopher. I mean, you probably end up doing better philosophy like you really become an uh, expert on a given subject. But I never wanted to be that expert on any given subject or you know, I wouldn't mind, but uh, uh, I get interested in something else. And so, so I, I, my first book was Philosophy of Social Sciences. Was that my main interest? No, my other book, which I was writing at the same time in the, in the 70s, was based on my PhD. And as, as I said, it was a, a defense of the rationality of science against various persuasive, uh, interesting uh, ideas that many other people thought led to relativism. So, and that was my main interest through the 80s, was, was the rationality of science, realism uh, versus anti-realism in the philosophy of science. I mean, do scientific theories get at the truth or are they just stories that are made up um, for the time and deemed to be superseded or due to be superseded uh, in a few years? Uh, so I worked on that a lot and I wrote a book uh, at the end of the 80s called Reality and Representation, which uh, this is kind of slightly baggy book it seems to me now because there were lots of things, but there were lots of things I'd been brought up with that I needed to argue myself out of. I mean the most striking thing I was brought up with was Popper and Popper's view that all scientific theories are false. I mean, Popper uh, was a terrible philosopher and he got this idea about the problem of induction and he could solve it by saying the key feature of science was falsifiability. And it's a corollary of his view that science never gets to 
find out anything about reality. It's all just conjectures that, in his view, will turn out to be refuted in time. And it's a completely ridiculous view of science. But that was the standard view of science among philosophers of science when I came into the subject as a 20-year-old. And it took me, it, I can pretty much count, it took me about 15 years to get out of it, into my early, early 30s. And I really resent it. I really resent the way that Popper influenced me in this, in this completely misguided way. And in fact, my first two books were kind of written within that Popperian framework. It's, uh, it was just so obviously wrong. And uh, just uh, shows it's not so easy to see your way through uh, when you know, all the people around you are thinking the same wrong way. But anyway, I, 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 people outside philosophy of science didn't think like that at all. It was, it was a kind of uh, slightly ghetto philosophy, but uh, 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 that wasn't supposed to be an allusion to Popper being Jewish or anything. It's just that it was a kind of this uh, uh, small clique of philosophers of science in, in uh, Britain and they were all Popperians. Popperianism was what you did if you were a philosopher of science. It was a very strange setup. Uh, all, all the, all the non-philosopher of science philosophers in Oxford had all been educated in classics and did greats or maybe PPE, but they certainly hadn't done any science. So their view was philosophy of science. So that you go after that and Popper for that. And so it was handed over to him to, to preach all this nonsense. And, uh, and I suffered as a result. You've done a lot of work on the philosophy of mind as well. What, mm -hmm. what are some questions that have interested you the most in that area? Well, representation and consciousness. Representation came out of my, my initial interest in the philosophy of science and how scientific terms get their meanings and then it became a general interest in how how words get meanings at all and uh, would you be able to just explain what representation is just for anyone listening who, uh, who isn't sure uh, just take um, well, we've got some books here just, just take words marks on paper right I, I don't know. they might say Lima is the capital of Peru right? or they might say yeah Elvis, had read, Elvis visited Paris in, in uh, 1967. Let's take one. Well, we don't know if it's true or not. Okay, so there's, there's some marks on paper and they state something. They have a meaning. They lay claim to how things work. They will be true if, if Elvis was in Paris and not if he wasn't. But how can these just marks on paper, what's the magic that enables them to say something about how things were, how things possibly were in Paris uh, 50 years ago. I mean, that's, that's a problem of representation. How can one thing stand for another? How can, how can marks or sounds or states of your brain uh, lay claim to distant states of affairs being thus and so? Does that explain it? That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. And the, the, so that, that, was, that was the general issue. I mean, I started off thinking about how, how the scientific terms uh, uh, there's a special problem some people think with scientific terms like electron or quark or so on because they refer to things that we never observe so how do we link up the things with their reference so that's one one uh, special special issue but there's a general issue just about how does one thing stand for something else and uh, there was a general functionalist answer to this was pretty popular in about early 80s uh, and Davidson had various views and I got involved in all that and I I came up with, along with various other people, what's now called a teleosemantic approach to representation. You need to think of representation in biological terms to understand it. And so that was one issue in philosophy of mind. And uh, another issue was consciousness, but that came in because I got interested in physicalism and I can't quite remember how, I can vaguely remember how at the end of the 80s I was still, so, so look, after, after I was in Reading, 
I then went to work in Australia for three years. And then with various hiccups, I ended up back in Cambridge in 1980. And I was there in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science for, for 10 years. And towards the end of that period, a lot of my colleagues were against reductionism in science because they said, look, kind of Kuhnian thought, new theories tend to be pretty different from old theories. You can't, you can't, you can't assume that that uh, old theories will reduce to special cases of new theories. And so, so physicalism is wrong. So the idea that the mind reduces to the brain is a mistake. And I thought, no, hang on, that's a, those are two different issues. I mean, whether the mind is just physical is surely nothing specially to do with the history of science. And so I got interested in this issue of physicalism. And of course, if you want to say, as I found myself inclined to, that, that everything is physical, nothing is in the spatio-temporal world that's not physical, the immediate challenge is posed by consciousness. Uh, consciousness doesn't look physical. Do you really want to say that consciousness is physical? And I thought, yes, I do. And so I got very interested in arguments about whether consciousness poses a problem for physicalism. And by that stage, so we're now in the, moving into the 90s, when I wrote a book called Philosophical Naturalism in 1992, I'd rather moved away from specialist philosophy of science topics and was working on general issues to do with, to do with naturalism. Uh, You've also wrote about, the philosophy, about, about philosophy and sport. How did that come about? That was just a kind of hobby I had for a while. Uh, it started because I had a website and the website had a blog facility and I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm, why, don't I, why don't I do some blogging? And then I thought, what's that blog about? You know, and and my wife, who's a journalist, said, look, you don't want to blog about, you know, just what do you think about life in general? What do you think about what's going on in Ukraine? What do you think about, about uh, nature philosophy? Uh, find yourself a niche. You've got to have a niche. You've got to have a kind of specific focus if you're doing, doing a blog. So, in fact, I've given a talk about philosophy of sport a couple of years before. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in sport now. I've played a lot of sports, uh, I watch a lot of sports. Uh, uh, it's kind of an important part of my life, I mean. Uh, but I never really connected that with philosophy. I mean, the people who do philosophy of sport, but it tends to be issues about drug policy and why is sport valuable and so on. And I, I never find anything very exciting there. But I was asked to give a talk in a lecture series. It was the London Olympics, and the Royal Institute of Philosophy put a lecture series on the philosophy of sport, and they asked me to to do a lecture. And I thought, well, you know, I'm on the council of the Royal Institute, and if I don't do it, I'm interested in the sport, I'm a philosopher, who's going to do it? So I said, okay. And I started trying to write something about the nature of sport and why it's valuable, and I thought, well, this is so boring. And uh, so I thought, look, I'll write about something that actually interests me, and is it philosophical? I don't care, it's interesting, and it's about fast reaction sports, and uh, you've got less than half a second, the ball comes and released, and you've got to... And so it's, it's all reflexes, it has to be reflexes, in fact. I mean, you're not really relying on your conscious vision at all, it's all too, too fast. But at the same time, athletes in these sports can decide you know, Roger Federer can decide he's going to play to Nadal's backhand all the time. So how can conscious control influence these instantaneous reflexes? And uh, it's an interesting question, and I developed various ideas about the structure of action control that seemed to me to give an answer. And I thought, well, so that, that was the talk I gave, and I thought, this is good. I, you know, I, I illustrated it with sporting examples and anecdotes, and I thought, this is fun. So when I had a blog, I thought I'll try and do more like that. I'll write about sporting philosophy issues, either in 
this case, I mean, as in that case, the, the sporting issues illuminate the philosophical question. I think, I think fast reaction sports tell us a lot about the structure of action control that applies to human action in general, but you wouldn't get at those answers unless you thought about this extreme case. So there's a case where, where uh, philosophical uh, issues are illuminated by sporting examples, but it also there were cases so I sort of right, that went the other way that, that one uh, used philosophical ideas to illuminate sporting issues. So I, and I started blogging. I wrote a whole lot of things about a lot of it was about the fast reaction sports and uh, uh, the experimental stuff that relates to that and choking and the yips. I wrote and then I wrote about uh, uh, cheating in sports. I mean, is it bad to do deliberate fouls, is it bad to, and, and uh, uh, there I appealed to philosophy and the distinction between morality and convention to illuminate the sporting issues and then I ended up writing about altruism and uh, cooperation and cycle racing and uh, amateurism and American college sports and I, I, I blogged for about four years, uh, three years, I did one one a month, I mean, uh, not quite. I ended up with more than 20 blog posts. And the, 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 the site did very well. I got a lot of, a lot of traffic and uh, I mean, not, not, not millions, but thousands. I think sometimes 10,000 would come to a blog post. And I got interest from, I got an agent. I mean, an, an agent came to me and said, would you write, like, like to write a book on this? So. So I did, and that's that's knowing the score. Two thousand and seventeen. Uh, I recommend it to your to your audience. Uh, did all right. It did all right in this country, uh, but it didn't sell a uh, hundred thousand. It sold about ten thousand, I think. Uh, and I was a bit. They got a lot of nice reviews, but I was a bit disappointed by the sales. But I I've been thinking that look. This is great because anybody who's interested in philosophy or sport is going to buy this book as a huge potential audience. But I think in in retrospect, uh, the people who are interested in the book and like it, the people who are interested in philosophy and sport, and the number of people in that, that intersection is rather rather small. But I'm still, I'm still kind of interested in the area. And, uh, sometimes I get asked to talk about it, but uh, I kind of think of that as something I've, I've done now. You said a minute ago that when you were writing your blog on sport, you didn't necessarily care about whether or not you were writing philosophically. I'm intrigued what you think about that, what you think philosophy is as opposed to other disciplines, if you think that's actually a helpful distinction to draw and maybe how that's changed over your career. I can remember in 1970 suggesting to a reading group of young Cambridge philosophers, let, let's read Dan Dennett, Content and Consciousness, his first book. And their view is, no, not really that, because that's not really philosophy, because it was all trying to understand neuroscience and how the brain worked, but in particular how the brain works such that content it represented and uh, uh, consciousness, where did that come from? But uh, my colleagues thought that you know, something that was so concerned with brains couldn't be philosophy. Now, now that's very much, that's very much changed. Uh, the example I had in mind was, was this fast sporting skills, exactly what's going on when uh, uh, is conscious control of these instantaneous reactions. And, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really very much mean this wasn't philosophical. I think it was recognised to be philosophical. It just wasn't the things that philosophers of sport were writing about when they tried to write about the nature of sport, the definition of sport, the value of sport. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty close to... to neuroscience, but philosophers come at the issues in a slightly different way from neuroscientists and they don't kind of try and produce new data, they try and construct explanations. So, 
so in fact, I think that battle's been won. I mean, some philosophers are more keen to engage with science than others, but I don't think many philosophers now would say that it's unphilosophical to engage with science or even to to produce articles or books that, that really are just bits of theoretical science. If you're a philosopher, you are likely to be adding new data uh, of a neuroscientific or, or physiological kind, but uh, you're theorizing about the same issues that the scientists theorize about. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe give some examples of the slightly different approach that a philosopher would take towards issues regarding the mind than, say, a neuroscientist? I myself don't think that that where they end up is necessarily interestingly different. I think both philosophers and neuroscientists in, philosophy, in, in studying the mind are trying to figure out uh, the best theoretical understanding of how the mind works. But I think the obstacles that they try to overcome are different. So in uh, scientists try and overcome the difficulty that we don't have enough data. We, 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 we need to do more experiments. Philosophers try and overcome the difficulty that our theories are in a mess, that they're leading us into paradox. And I have a view that the, the, the typical philosophical problem is where one line of thought leads you to one, one conclusion, different line of thought leads you to the contrary conclusion, and you can't really figure out uh, what, what's gone wrong. So, I don't know, in uh, consciousness and, and the brain, uh, uh, conscious mental states must be identical to brain states because otherwise how could they influence our behaviour? Uh, nothing influences our behaviour, there isn't uh, processes going on in the brain, that's one, one line of argument, so they must be, must be physical. Uh, uh, contrary line of argument, look, isn't it possible that there could be a being that's physically just like me but has no feelings, a, a zombie? I mean, they're not saying, I'm not saying that that's actual, but surely it's possible. Uh, and uh, that's a contrary argument, that consciousness must be something extra to what's going on in the brain. And, okay, now, you, now you're stuck, right? And, and uh, uh, the aim is to figure out you know, what's the right theory of what uh, our psychology consists of and how it drives our behaviour. But, but that puzzle that I've just posed to you isn't a problem that a neuroscientist is... Well, good neuroscientists ought to be worried about that problem, but it's not a scientific problem. And uh, when they address it, they will have to switch their mind to, to using philosophical tools, which is, you know, looking at the arguments. We've got two arguments leading us to contrary conclusions. You've got to unpick the argument. You've got to find some premise in there that you can get rid of. I mean, often it's a premise that you didn't even realise that you had. Uh, uh, that's the philosophical task. Uh, I mean, that's an issue. I mean consciousness that kind of arises within science. I mean, neuroscientists are concerned about consciousness, but they don't always think about it very straight. And you, you find, because of the way I've just described the nature of philosophical problems, lots of philosophical problems arising within science. Like, what's the right way to understand uh, quantum mechanics? Uh, what's the right way to explain the evolution of altruism in, in animals, uh, given that Darwinism seems to suggest it shouldn't, shouldn't evolve? And, and those are philosophical problems because they involve contradictions and they're best addressed by philosophical tools, which is not to say that the most, uh, well, from my perspective, best physicists and biologists will not address those problems, but they'll address them in the same way as, as philosophers. So, Yes. Does that answer your question? That's great. So, I wanted to ask, what is it about philosophy that you've enjoyed that's kept you working on it for so long? I...
said, no, look, it, I'm now getting well into my 70s and and I could, you know, you might expect that I'll, I'll retire and, you know, go and do my gardening, but no way. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you don't have to pay me to do philosophy. In fact, you'd have to pay me not to do philosophy. I mean, I, uh, uh, so it's, it's fun for me. Uh, uh, my, my friend and colleague, Michael Devitt, who's now in his 80s and is still blasting away, producing, producing books. But he said, you know, David, when I, when I uh, was young, I first trained as an accountant and I worked as an accountant and it was, it was all right. But then I, I went back to university and did philosophy and that was just such a release. This was fun. This is something I liked, I liked doing. So, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be such fun if I didn't think it was important. Uh, and uh, we can discuss about why, why philosophy is important, but I think, I mean, it's clearly, uh, uh, it's part of what it is to be human, to be curious and puzzled and try to understand. And uh, professional philosophers do it in a particularly kind of professional and disciplined way, but uh, it's just exercising uh, the desire to to understand things and I think you know I don't go along you know the unexamined life is worth living I don't especially think everybody you know, you're, you're you're not a worthwhile person if you don't have philosophical inclinations but uh, plenty of people do and it would be a poor world if we didn't have people doing doing philosophy in it uh, but it's not for everybody. Not everybody has philosophical inclinations, and even people who have philosophical inclinations, not all of them uh, get satisfaction out of sitting and reading and thinking about it and writing about it all the time. But I'm just happy that I'm one of the people who, who does. I can remember a, a friend of mine you know, when we were just young and finding our way, and I'd been an academic for, I don't know, six or seven years, and and I wrote two books, and and he said to me, look, David, you've, you've found your métier, I mean, you've found something that, you found what you do, and it's true, I mean, you know, it's not, you know, plenty of people can't just write two books like that, but I didn't find it, you know, and I found it a completely natural thing to do, and uh, uh, you know, I'm glad, mm -hmm. okay. When you're not officially working mm. as an academic philosopher, when you're at home or with family, mm. are you often thinking deeply and philosophically about life? Do you ever have, have a break from it? When well, I'm thinking deeply and philosophically about life, I mean, sometimes I think about life, perhaps not that deeply or philosophically, but uh, uh, most of the philosophy that I think about isn't especially about life. Uh, uh, you know, I think about other things quite a lot. I mean, I, I think about my family, I think about sport, I think about friends, I think about, uh, you know, what's happening with my children. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I spend time with, with people who aren't philosophers a lot. Uh, on the other hand, when I'm not thinking about any of those things, then I'm thinking about philosophy. Uh, you know, if, if uh, I don't know, uh, you know, if I'm sitting on the bus, I mean, nowadays, you can always take your phone out and start fiddling with it. But, you know, suppose I was uh, restrained from taking out my phone and now sitting on the bus, I think about philosophy. What else would I think about? Mm. Uh, I mean, unless, you know, unless I had some personal pressing issues uh, 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 grabbing, my, grabbing my attention. But that's what I like to think about, yeah. Mm. And so you're a lecturer at King's College London. You yeah. were spending I think half a year for a long while also in New York, but that's come to an end, is that right? That's right. I mean, COVID put a stop to that. I mean, I was, I was going every spring term 
I mean, I was employed by City University of New York February through June. And I'd go there, be in February and stay pretty much to mid-May. And But I'd come back here quite a lot to see my my family. So, you know, I, I taught a 15 week, 15 week course to the graduate students in the CUNY, City University of York Graduate Centre for, for those six years. Uh, and then when COVID came and the, I've just been back to New York now after two years away and gave a whole lot of talks that uh, and in most of the cases of the talks I gave, I'd been at that seminar, I'd been going to give a talk two years ago, and then everything just closed down. I can remember the, the New York University Mind and Language seminar. I gave, I think it was like March the 10th, 2020. It was on a Tuesday. And then CUNY said we're going to put all the teaching online and, and on the Wednesday I saw some graduate students and on the Thursday I thought why am I still in New York if uh, I'm going to get COVID and the teaching online and I jumped on a plane and came back to England and a lot of my colleagues packed up their cars and went off to Montana, everybody scattered to the four winds and that was two, two years ago and I taught that course Online, but CUNY's view was was that uh, if if we were all restricted in our countries by by COVID, I, uh, I mean I've been on a rolling contract, new contract each year, so that's now that's now finished. Uh, maybe it'll start up sometime in the future, but uh, for the moment I'm back here all year round. Mm -hmm. But I like I like doing philosophy in New York. It's a it's a very lively place for philosophy. Was there much sort of a different approach that American students took towards? the students that you've taught in London? Not markedly so. Uh, I do pretty science orientated philosophy. I mean, the, the, the students were pretty much the same, but I had, I found a lot more colleagues with similar interests and inclinations to mine in in New York than London. I mean, I don't know if I'm exaggerating. I mean, you, you, you know, you go to a place kind of as a visitor, you're inclined to put yourself about a bit more if you're, you know, at home, you just carry on doing your normal thing. But uh, for whatever reason, when I went to New York, I had a lot of philosophical fun. It was, it was very lively for me philosophically. Okay, so final question, David. What are you currently working on at the moment and what plans do you have for philosophy in the next few years? Oh, uh, I've got a kind of little project on knowledge. A lot of philosophers in epistemology think knowledge is a very important thing and I've, I've had a, a suspicion for a long time that we shouldn't be worrying about knowledge, we should just be worrying about getting at the truth and knowledge is this kind of distraction and now I've got an argument and I've been pushing that a bit. But my main project at the moment is is causation. And this is interesting. So causal inference is a buzz term at the moment, and it's to do with people inferring causes from correlations. You look at correlations between who's got COVID, obesity, the temperature, and the income, and you try and figure out what's causing what's causing what. And people have been doing this correlations to causes for 100 years. But uh, it's really been highlighted recently, both because of COVID and epidemiology, but also because of big data and computer techniques. And, uh, and the philosophers have been a bit slow to catch up with this. And my complaint is none of the philosophical theories of causation explain why these causal inference techniques work. And so I'm developing a, a metaphysical account of causation, which I don't think anybody else has, that will explain explain the causal inference techniques. It's an obvious thing. I mean, out there, millions of non-experimental scientists inferring causes from correlations all over the place, and the philosophers had nothing to say about why why uh, 
this this kind of procedure works. Uh, anyway, I, I want to come in and fill this gap. But the interesting thing is, the ideas I'm developing now are ones that I had first back in the 70s and somehow I wasn't able then, uh, wasn't enough other people working on it, the, 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 the understanding of causal inference techniques hadn't developed enough, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean I read a couple of articles but I could never kind of run the project through and now we're talking 40 years later, now hang on, let me, let me, let me do the sums. I, how is this possible? We're talking 50 years later. Where did it all go? Uh, uh, I, I first started lecturing at the University of Reading and I had this strong background in mathematical statistics and I got very interested in the sociologists inferring causes from correlations and I started trying to develop ideas about how that worked and that would have been I started at Reading in 1973, that's nearly 50 years ago. And now I've finally cleared the space to work out these ideas in full and I'm writing a book, a book about it. And there's something both disturbing and satisfying about having a project that you've had for 50 years and now I'm gonna try and nail it down, but I'm sure I'll be able to. Well, I wish you all the best of it. Thanks, Thanks so much for sharing some of your story and. If you're willing, maybe it'd be great to speak to you again at another point and actually get more into some of your ideas and um, philosophical viewpoints. But for now, it's great. Thanks a lot, David. I'd be glad to talk again, but thank you now. Thank you for now. That was great. Thanks. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the Human Podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.